from the general ocean turbulence model. I made, uh, configured it to examine bottom boundary layer. Uh, essentially, general ocean turbulence model is a 1D oceanographic model for the vertical water column model to examine turbulence and other processes in the vertical. Uh, it actually provides the turbulence, vertical turbulence and mixing for, for many ocean models. In this case, I took their estuary test case and modified it a bit. What we're doing is we're driving a constant density water column using a pressure gradient, which is how um, mimicking the tide forcing every 12, uh, with a 12 hour or twice a day oscillation. The pressure gradient in units of sea surface slope or meters per meter is one meter every 100 kilometers. So it's one e to the minus five is the slope. The depth of the water column is 10 meters and all these graphs um, the left or the uh, the vertical coordinate is the vertical coordinate of the water column positive up so there's 10 meters here's the bottom and we're oscillating with a 12 hour cycle this pressure gradient back and forth uh, producing a symmetric solution. I'll show you what the graphs are and then I'll start the simulation. The top here you see velocity magnitude time is on the x-axis here in hours so 48 hours or two days or four tidal cycles. This is a velocity magnitude, or the absolute value of the velocity. And you can see it goes from peak to slack to peak to slack. So this is flood, actually it's flood, ebb, flood, ebb, etc. Um, uh, with slack water in between. And the largest velocities are occurring at the surface um, because we have a bottom boundary layer forming. We can see that in this plot here. Uh, in fact, when this simulation, the first time frame from the simulation, which we're looking at now, it basically coincides with peak flood. So here's your bottom boundary layer at peak flood. Um, now the ocean, general ocean turbulence model, the velocities are stored in layers. Um, so it is applying a no-slip, effectively a no-slip boundary condition, but here the, um, the bottom layer still has a finite velocity. And here you see the, the turbulent log layer extending up into the water column. And this pressure gradient of about 1 e to the minus 5 produces roughly um, 60 centimeter per second flow in a water column that's 10 meters deep um, using the k epsilon turbulence model and the only other parameter that would influence this is the bottom roughness um, which affects the bottom friction in this case I used a 2 centimeter physical roughness scale um, this shows the level mixing in the water columns the eddy, uh, turbulent eddy viscosity in meters squared per second, so it's kinematic, and we have uh, the same oscillation occurring where you have slack water, peak flood, and you get during these peak times, which is shown in the snapshot here, we, we see this is the profile of the eddy viscosity in the water column. It peaks out at about 0.02 meters squared per second, roughly halfway up the water column, and this is a close to a parabolic profile which is what you would see in an open channel flow. Open channel flow is where we would force the water column with a constant pressure gradient until everything reached equilibrium. The forcing is constant and thus eventually that forcing would match exactly the, um, the positive force in, uh, driven by the pressure gradient would be opposed exactly by bottom friction. And you would see a similar um, parabolic mixing profile here. Um, this of course is just one snapshot of time. And so you'll see as the simulation goes on, we go from flood to slack to ebb to flood um, to slack to ebb uh, flood again. And the eddy viscosity will be responding similarly. During peak flood and ebb, you have this nice parabolic profile and close to zero uh, during slack tide. There is some inertia to the water current, um, which will influence uh, how exactly this comes back to zero. And then the third plot here is scalar concentration. I wanted to really show you sediment, but the ocean general ocean turbulence model doesn't have a true sediment model whereby sediment can actually um, settle down into the bed out of the water column and that mass flux can be pulled out of the bed um, through erosion back into the water column. All um, The best I can do is to add a scalar term which could represent say phytoplankton or sediment that's not, um, not allowed to settle into the bed. Perhaps Imagine this as a, a test tank with a glass floor. Um, so what's happening is you have um, these phytoplankton cells. Now they they have a settling velocity. They're not growing or dying or anything like that. It's just a bunch of passive cells that have 
um, that are heavier than the water column such that they sink at a rate of a millimeter per second. That's a typical settling velocity of a coarse sand. Um, so it starts off, not shown here, at constant concentration in the water column and then you see this sort of cycling that's occurring and this is because during peak flood, or actually this is ebb, but during peak currents you have strong mixing and the strong mixing will tend to mix the try to it tries to basically create a uniform value for the scalar in the water column. Now the mixing is being opposed by the settling velocity, which is trying to gather the concentrate uh, gather the phytoplankton or sediment towards the bottom of the water column. So as we reach slack, the mixing cuts off, and there's no mixing to try to keep the concentration even in the water column, and things start to settle down and slump at the bottom, forming this high concentration pocket here. Now you would not see this in true sediment because this would re this concentration um, or the sediment would actually be going back into the bed and then eroding out and into the bed. Um, but the dynamics are similar. So here the phytoplankton are getting mixed up in the water column. Then as we re go towards slack the mixing is decreasing here um, and so the settling is winning over the mixing and it starts to create these high concentration areas at the bottom and then come back to flood again, the mixing's picking up and it mixes back into the water column uh, and this repeats over cycles. At this point of peak flood you have this very typical profile here. This is again what you would see in an open channel flow um, a, a equilibrium sediment concentration profile. That's a commonly used test case in fact for sediment models where you have the largest concentration occurring at the bottom because you have settling this is essentially a equilibrium between um, uh, the mixing of this passive tracer and a settling velocity which tends to gather it towards the bottom. If you didn't have a settling velocity the mixing would, would produce a uniform or close to uniform profile here or be a uniform profile. But we have settling velocity tends to gather uh, this in the highest concentrations at the bottom. These kind of pulses and concentration levels we're seeing um, are based on a lot of things. The amount of mixing in the water column which depends on the forcing and the depth and the roughness at the bottom and also the properties of the sediment or phytoplankton itself. Namely, the most important one being the settling velocity. A larger settling velocity tends to keep the concentrations higher near the bottom and it won't get mixed as far into the water column. The weaker or lighter sediments um, will are able to be mixed further into the water column. Um, and again, this is effectively like a coarse sand, so we're seeing it getting up about a meter off the bottom um, in reasonable concentrations. And then finally, this plot shows the bed stress. Um, there's a magnitude of the bed stress in newtons per meter squared. Um, it's under a newton per meter squared, so about a half newton per meter squared. And you can see at each peak, ebb, flood, ebb, flood, um, you have the highest magnitudes. And at slack tide, there is no stress on the bed. Um, if we're talking about sediment dynamics, um, the amount of erosion or um, mass flux out of the bed into the water column, the sediment is will be peak when are we reach our peak bottom stress. So it's that ratio. The key parameter is the ratio of the bed stress produced by the fluid to the critical shear stress of the sediment. Um, if that bed stress exceeds the critical shear stress, it can it can actually suspend the sediment out of the bed. Um, and the larger ratio that is, the larger, the more sediments essentially are coming out of the bed. And there's some relations, complex relations for that, but that's the basic idea. Um, so let me go ahead and start, if I can, this movie. Um, and you'll just see it sort of cycle over and over again. It's periodic over two days, so we can think of this an infinite amount of time. It's reached a quasi-steady solution. Um, and the black bar indicates where we are in time. So this is all coinciding in time. Um, and so we're going from peak flood peak to slack to peak um, flood uh, again. And you can see that happening up here we go from ebb, peak ebb to peak flood. And on, during peak flood and ebb you'll see the eddy viscosity responding or the mixing responding in the same way. Strongest mixing on peak ebb to slack zero back to strongest mixing on peak flood. And the scalar concentration is doing something similar. As it goes towards slack you'll see the concentration peak at the bottom where the settling's winning over the mixing. And then as we move towards peak flood or ebb when the mixing is highest, 
you'll tend to be more uniform in the water column. So it's slumping at slack, mixing and flood, slumping at slack, uh, mixing at flood, etc. Um, and you see this, uh, this diagram, basically what you're seeing here is what's happening along this black line um, in time. And so you're this intermittent slack periods between the flood and ebb periods. I think that about sums it up.